Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I should tell you I used to teach ninth grade, so <laughs> it's part of who I am. And I should also warn you that um, recently I found, well, not that recently anymore, maybe a couple years ago, I found a report card from kindergarten or first grade or something, and the teacher said she's really bossy. And she totally nailed it. So <laughs> I'm going to be a little bit bossy with you right now, and I'm going to ask you to just push your chairs back away from your desk here. Put everything out of your hands. Oh, I should also ask you to uh, turn off your cell phones or put them on silent. Put them away for this one hour. I would like to have your full attention. I know it's painful, but we'll get through it. So if you would uncross your legs and put both your feet on the floor, if that's possible. Sit up nice and straight so you can notice your breath. Because that's one thing we definitely all have in common. We're all alive and in part because we're breathing. So just turn your attention to your breath and notice when you breathe in, is the air warm or cool? And compare it to when you exhale. Which one's warmer or cooler, your in-breath or your out-breath? Which breath is longer, your in-breath or your out-breath? Or are they even? Just notice. And if you're willing, close your eyes and pretend, bless you, notice that your heart is beating. Imagine you can hear it, feel it beating like your own inner drum. So we're going to just simply take three deep breaths together. You're going to exhale first. Breathe in deep. Hold it for a moment and then just relax. Let all the air out. Bless you. Take three deep breaths on your own. Exhaling first, breathe in deep, holding it, and then letting go. Allow yourself to relax. Relax your shoulders, your face. So if you were aware of the fact that you, everyone in this room, has gathered wisdom over the course of your lives, ask yourself, when was a time that I had to face something challenging? And see if you can come up with a time where something in your life was challenging and you had to deal with it. What was it? And then see if you can think of the quality, a quality that you have that allowed you to face into something that was difficult. Hi, Tunde. So maybe what you were able to lean into was your courage, your kindness, your compassion. What is it for you? that allows you to step into the greatness of your human potential when you're facing something adverse. What is it that has you wired to survive, to thrive? And then once you have an awareness of what that quality is, just take a moment to thank yourself. You are able to step into your greatness, into the capacity of what makes you a great being. So just take a moment to bring your awareness back to your breath. You are seated in a chair. Some of you have your eyes closed. Some of you have them open. But bring your awareness back to this room, and if your eyes are closed, open them as you will. So turn to your neighbor. You're going to be doing a little bit of talking to each other. Turn to your neighbor, and before you start, you're just going to tell them the quality that you have that allows you to step into your greatness. 
Again, it could be your courage, your compassion. What is it about you that when you exhibit that quality, it actually lifts other people up in you too? What is just the quality? And then when you see me raise my hand, please raise your hand and stop talking. Okay, so go. The quality that you have that makes you great. Okay, so why don't we just shout out some of the qualities that are in this room right now. They are the qualities that make you great, and they really inform your moral compass. Everybody has one. Whether you listen to it or not is another story. But So what are some of the qualities that are here? Shout them out to me. Passion. Passion. Calm. Calmness. Endurance. Endurance. Who said that? Endurance, yes. What else? Resiliency. Resiliency. Perseverance. What else? Hmm? Happiness. Happiness. Joy. What else? Hmm? Empathy. Empathy. What else? Bravery. Bravery. Courage. What about back in here? What'd you say, sir? Caring. Caring. And you said? Strength. Caring and strength. Let me get a couple more from back here. What is it? Confidence. Confidence. Yes. Yes, sir. Helping people, being of service. Understanding. So notice that these qualities that you have that actually contribute to your greatness are not in competition with one another, are they? They actually support each other. And really, looking at this room today as community, you're part of a community of this school, Part of the invitation to engage in understanding what social justice actually means requires that you lean into these qualities that you have that make you great. So I'm going to be moving pretty fast because I don't have very much time with you, but I just want to tell you that what we just did is called conocimiento. I have a reason why I asked you to breathe and to explore your strengths even though we did it in a very quick kind of way. You could look at the strengths that you just named, remember a time when you were being that strength, and what the behaviors are that are associated with that strength. Let me play with one of you just for a minute. Somebody give me a strength. What was your strength again? Perseverance. Perseverance. So when you are persevering, what are you actually doing that ends up meaning that you have persevered? Okay, so pushing, you so like pushing through it to get to it. Right, so but first you have to set a what? Goal. You have a goal or an intention, mm -hmm. and then you plan. you plan what you're going to do in order to achieve that goal. And then you act. And then you act and you do it. And you may have to do it over and over and over again, right? So every quality that you name means that you have behavior that allows you to operationalize what you say you are. And oftentimes, we don't spend a lot of time thinking about the behavior that is required to be the thing that we say we want to be. And there are times when you persevere, but I bet you there are also times when you quit. Is that not true for all of us? When we are being our best, we act out in alignment with our highest values. But there may be lots of times when that doesn't happen. And part of what it means to be human is to explore the gap 
between when you are at your best and when you are not at your best. And when you do that, when you engage in that reflection of that process, it helps you grow. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my own personal journey that I call from Snow White to Zootopia. But first, I want to tell you this. Would somebody read this out loud who has a nice, loud voice? Yes. Community exists when people who are interdependent struggle with the traditions that bind them and, that, and the interests that separate them so they can realize a future that is in improvement on past. Thank you so much. Will somebody else read it? Someone with a nice, a nice loud voice. Read it again. Remember the ninth grade part? I'll just choose you. Yes, in the back. Community exists when people who are interdependent struggle with the traditions that bind them and the interests that separate them so they can realize a future that is an improvement on the past. Right. So there's work that needs to be done. If, in fact, we value community, if, in fact, we understand that from the moment you open your eyes till the moment you go to bed and throughout the night, that your existence means that you are interdependent with all of the forces that allow you to be where you are, from the clothes you wear to the food that you eat, to the people who support you and the people who do not. Every experience that you have is happening because you are not just an individual. You are more than an individual. You are part of a collective of people, some of who you know and some of whom you do not, who make your existence possible. And in order to make that more robust, there's some learning that needs to happen. This is my mother. My mother was born in Odessa. It was called, was part of the Soviet Union, but now is the Ukraine. She was born in 1911. This is my father. My father was born in 1890. He was 21 years older than my mother. This is my second grade classroom, Little Brown Schoolhouse. I grew up in Harlem. And I grew up in Harlem. Does everybody know where Harlem is? Does anybody who doesn't in New York? Um, I grew up in Harlem because my mother's family disowned her because she married my father. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Because my mother married a black man, her family disowned her. Now, why did this happen? Many, 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 many reasons. But certainly, they were acting out of their belief system that indicated to them that this was a problem, that their daughter would marry a black man, who was, by the way, from Barbados in the West Indies. So I'm a Caribbean person. When I was in the second grade, my auntie took me to see Snow White. How many of you have ever seen Snow White? What'd you think? Snow White. It was Snow White. <laughs> and I loved that movie. I loved that movie. And you know, in those days when you went to the movies, you could stay in the movie and watch a movie over and over again. And so my aunt let me watch this movie three times. <laughs> but part of what happened to me was that I understood at a very young age that I would never be Snow White, ever, ever, ever. And what did that mean? What did it mean to a light-skinned colored girl, which is how I was referred to at the time, to recognize that because of race, because of my packaging, I would not belong. So you're going to have a very quick conversation with your neighbor. Two by two is best, but in some cases, there may be three of you. Um, but, and if you don't want to talk, you don't have to. But here's the question. When is the first time in your life that you noticed race? The first time in your life that you noticed race. So go ahead. You have 
maybe three minutes. The first time you noticed race. Okay, it sounds like you've mostly finished, so I don't even need to raise my hand. But did everybody answer the question? Is there anybody who couldn't answer the question? You couldn't answer the question. Okay, we'll talk later. Oh, I mean, I couldn't answer, but I didn't have time. Oh, you didn't have time. Oh, well, maybe they'll give you some time a little bit later. So, um, I just want you to notice that with all of the belief that it's difficult to talk about race, you just did it. It was a very short conversation, and maybe not even a conversation, but look, all of your body parts are still intact. <laughs> it's, all okay. it's okay that we actually have this conversation because when you cannot name something, when you don't understand how it operates because you haven't really been taught, you can't analyze it you can't interrupt it. You just can't. So I want to talk to you a little bit about systems. And I want to take the focus off of you as just an individual. OK? Understand this, that as we talk about this, that you were born into a history that nobody in this room created. Nobody in this room created the history that has been pulled through and informs our present time. Nobody here created the system. Nobody. So rather than us getting embroiled in shame or guilt or fear and all that stuff that comes up when we talk about race, maybe you could just set that aside for a moment and let's look at how it really operates. So what is the system? If I were to ask you, if I were to ask you, what is the purpose of your human system? What is the job of your system? Its primary job is to keep you what? Alive. To keep you alive. And how does it do that? There's lots of stuff going on that you're not even aware of, right? It's happening right now. It lets you sit here, hold your pen or your pencil, write, talk to your neighbor, you're not understanding necessarily all of the things that are actually going on in your body at this very moment that allows you to be here. Your system, your human system, has structures, right? What are some of the structures of your human system? Skeletal? I'm sorry? Muscular system? What else? Nervous system? Lots and lots of things are going on inside your system right now to keep you alive, yes? Your system has structures that we just named, right? These structures are, if we were to describe it simply, to say cells that have differentiated themselves and grouped together according to function in order to keep your body alive. Your body needs these structures in order to do its job. And when it doesn't have all of those structures, what does it do? It compensates so that you can keep being alive until you're not anymore. So let's understand that I'm going to use the word racialization, the process of creating racial inequity. And we could be talking about class. We could be talking about gender. 
We could be talking about poverty. We could be talking about a lot of things that all operate in the same way. They are part of a system whose job it is in this case to turn out inequity. That is the job of the system. The system is embedded in history. How many of you feel like you've really learned history well in school? And I'm not talking about your grade. I mean the scope of the content you've learned. How many of you feel like you've had a good education and really understand history? Yes. And what about global history? So we're, we're going to come back to history in just a moment. But history influences culture. And culture tells you who you are. It helps you arrive at your identity. Is there anyone who disagrees with that? Am I putting you to sleep yet? Good. So the system embedded in history and culture and identity <coughs> is moved by power and economics. Power and economics. And it has internal components and external components, which you can see here. I would like to give you a, um, a research tool that you can write down. It's called racialequitytools.org. Racialequitytools.org. So you can look up more about structure you can come to know more about bias and privilege and internalized racism and all of these other components that are here. And if I have time, I'll come back to it. But the thing that I would like you to understand about the system is that it's made up of a lot of moving parts that work together and they are interconnected. And the system is not linear. It's not happening one thing at a time. And you can see if you look at the images on the screen that the institutions that make up the structure, like in our body, the bones, the brain, the heart, the circulatory system, the structure of the system of inequity is advanced, contributed to, continues because of the structure, institutions combined, of education, banking, healthcare, uh, the legal system, media, housing and so on and so forth, which we normally don't think about. Somebody tell me, what is culture? What do we mean by culture? Anybody? You can hardly get it wrong. What is culture? Yes. It's what we do. <laughs> and how do we do what we do? What is the role that culture plays in society? Think about your culture. You may have more than one. You may be part of several different cultures. But what does culture tell you? How does it give you a message? Yes? Well, it's like your culture is like your values and beliefs. Your values and your beliefs. Yes, very good. And we understand that a lot of these values and beliefs are passed on through your education, the kind of art you see, the kind of television, movies that you watch, um, and they indicate who you are as part of society and your place in that society. And it has its own systems of beliefs as well. So it's complex. I want to show you a very short clip. And it's a very, very, very old footage. So at first, you won't see it very well. You'll see some writing. I'll try to paraphrase it for you. And um, we're not going to watch all of it, just for uh, just a couple of minutes. So this is written by the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, who said, I do not believe that Indians, people who for the most part speak no English, live in squalor and degradation, make little progress from year to year, who are a perpetual source of, um, I can't read it myself, a source of expense to the government and a constant menace to thousands of their white neighbors, a hindrance to civilization and a clog 
in the fabric of life. This is from the superintendent of the Carlisle Indian School. You should know what Indian schools were boarding schools. And you transfer young Indian children into those schools so that they can grow up and be civilized. This is from a particular school that operated from 1831 to 1970 called the Mush Hole. And this particular school, um, we talk about what happens after the schools are gone, what continues to impact Native Americans. That's a song that was counting dead Indians uh, back on the trails when they would kill Indians. You'd see all these little kids in uniform and we'd be wondering how come they're like that. We weren't dressed like that, but these little kids were. I remember being younger, growing up on a reservation and being told, don't trust white people, don't listen to them. You never told why. The government schools are constantly being built and hospitals added. We bring them in, clean them up, and start them on their way to civilization. I would ask social services and human services audience, how many people know about residential boarding schools? How many people here do? This never makes it into the history books. This is never talked about. Why did those schools get started, and who started them, and what was the rationale behind it? So let's start there. Why were those schools started? Who started them? And what was the rationale? What were you taught if you even looked at boarding schools, native boarding schools that existed in Canada, here, in South Africa, in Australia, New Zealand? What was the purpose of these boarding schools? To force acculturation. To force acculturation. Anybody else? Yes? But why? Yes, that's true. Because why? Believe that, that a different culture was better. Than a different culture is better. Why? Why is a different culture better? What is the reason behind taking it? What if somebody came to your house and took your child away from you because you represented what was not civilized? And by the way, they could only speak English and suffer the consequences if they lapsed into their native land. Why? What was the real purpose? Think power and economics. You have to have the power to be able to get what you want economically. What were you going to say? Uh, I was thinking that maybe so they couldn't, so the culture would die. They couldn't come together. And right, because the culture is the glue, yeah. right, that holds you together as a people. But what was really wanted here? Say it again. Land. The land. You can look back in your history books, maybe even into some of your families. The government gave away free land. Free land. Why? To develop the nation. For what purpose? So this basic fact describes part of the system. I go to universities all over the country even places where there are lots of Native people. I've never, ever been in a school where more than one half of 1% of the student population was Native. And if they do come, they may not stay. When you understand systems, you stop looking at yourself as an individual only, and you begin to understand patterns and relationships. Patterns and relationships. There are patterns stemming from the original 
removal of native land and what was happened in order to interrupt that culture. Can you think of any of those patterns that still exist today? Broken agreements. Does anybody know how states were formed? You should look that up. Yes. Still, children are still removed from families. What about our immigration patterns? Who are the cultural stealers? Who must speak English only? How many of you have ever traveled to Europe? When you go to Europe, do you notice that there are places where people comfortably speak more than one language? Is that an advantage or a disadvantage? What makes it an advantage there and not an advantage here? When you start asking questions, you have to explore what was done long before you were born, but it's still part of the way that we are. I grew up with this. These were Native Americans. I didn't know any. I didn't know I sang that song, One Little Indian, Two Little Indian. I never knew what that meant. Some of you probably not heard it because you're younger. But if you're here and you're older, you probably know this song. What does this picture tell you about a people? Are they to be respected, honored, seen as intelligent? No, not in the least. What about this one? Can you see that in the back? Let me go to here. What about this one? What about this one? Fantasia, great Walt Disney film. Who is beautiful in this picture? Who is intelligent? Who's being taken care of? What is the depiction of this young black child, African child? Smart? To be envied? Belonging? No. This was a program that was on TV, Amos and Andy. Anybody here ever seen Amos and Andy show? All the old people in the room raised their hands. <laughs> I hated this program. I hated, hated, hated this program. Why? Because people weren't laughing with them. They were laughing at them. They were stereotypes. And this is how we become familiar with people that we don't know, based upon biased stereotypes of what they represent. How on earth are you supposed to know any people if you've not ever really had contact with them other than through primarily the media? Are you with me? So let me just see that here. How many of you ever watched a program called The Walden Family or Fathers Knows Best or what were some of the programs? Name them that you watched. It had to do with the typical American family. Leave it to Beaver. Full House. Full House. Little, House. Little House on the Prairie. This is how you learn what an American family is supposed to look like, how they're supposed to behave. What about this one? Who's this? What do you learn from these images? So you can see that it's very easy if you start to understand how the brain functions, how neural pathways are formed, that the human mind likes to fill in the blanks. We tend to think we know a lot about what we don't know anything about. And it definitely creates inequities. And the rules and regulations that follow are also about those inequities. So let's go back here a little bit. What is bias? How many people in this room feel that they have bias? If you're not raising your hand, you're lying. There's no way you cannot have bias. It's just not possible. What is unconscious bias? Anybody know? People who feel made 
<laughs> Don't start trouble for me here. <laughs> what is unconscious bias? It's also called implicit bias. Yes, sir. Um, when somebody doesn't believe they're biased, but in an actuality they don't realize they are? Um, sort of. You're close. You're, cl you're very close. Anybody else want to take a guess at it? Implicit bias? Yes, you in the back. Yeah, you. Sort of. Yes, all the way in the back. So someone behaves in a biased way, like they treat one person different than another, but they're not aware that they're doing it. Yes. They're, that's, that's, that's very close. You're not aware that you're doing it. Let me ask it a different way, because I don't think I'm being really clear. How does implicit bias happen? Unconsciously. Unconsciously, but what does that mean? Yes. Yes, it's definitely taught to you. And when the brain, your file cabinet, goes to pull out an answer for something, it goes into something it doesn't really know very well, and it substitutes it with what you think you know, but it happens so fast, you don't even know that you're actually making a decision. So write this down. Implicit bias test. Implicit bias test created by Harvard. You can go online and look up the implicit bias test and take the test. And guess how the test is structured. It's not just about race. It's about a lot of things, and it's really kind of fun. But what happens is they show you images, and you have to make selections about that image really quickly, so fast that you don't have a chance to think about it. And you will see where your biases are in terms of what you buy, products, whether you like Coke better than Pepsi. You know, how you make these decisions are informed by information that has been absorbed in your brain, but is not conscious to you, necessarily. So I would suggest, if I were your um, professor here, I would say you have to take this test. But of course, I'm not, and so I won't. Um, I need seven people with really strong voices to come right here. Don't all rush up here at once, but do come. Yes, come, 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 seven people. Yes, you can give them a hand. They're, they're, okay, one, two, three, four, five, a woman, yay. Hey, we're in the same class. Yeah, we are. Five, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. I need one more person, two, four, six. One more person. Another woman. One more person, come, come, come. Thank you. So all you're going to do is relatively painless. You're going to read the slides that come up um, that I haven't started yet. So you may want to come around to the back. So what I'm going to present to you now are seven slides that talk about this system and how it's played out in policy and law over time. This is a brief, brief excerpt. Let's see, let me go here. Okay, read nice and loud so they can hear you. Who's going to go first? Come close, come close so you can see. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the 1790 Naturalization Act permitted only three white persons to become naturalized citizens, thus opening the doors to some European immigrants, but no others. Only citizens could vote, serve on juries, hold office, and in some cases even hold property. Immigration restrictions further limited opportunities for people of color. Racial barriers to naturalization, or naturalized, sorry, U.S. citizenship weren't removed until the McCarran-Walter Act in 1952, and white racial preferences in immigration remained explicit until 1965. So we know that this might be by law, that they remain explicit until 1965, but in fact they still remain, don't they? Yeah. Okay, next one. Thank you, ma'am. In 1830, Indian Removal Act forcibly relocated Cherokee Creeks and other eastern Indians to the west of the Mississippi <coughs> River to make room for white settlers. As white U.S. citizens also moved from, sorry, moved into former Mexican territories, the rights and privileges of Mexicans eroded. 
Once territories had a significant white majority, instead of Indian or Mexican majorities, the territories became <coughs> states. Most of the former Me Mexicans lost their territory. Sorry. That's okay. Take your time. Um, most of the former Mexicans lost their treaty uh, regarded rights of citizenship, land, and resources in these new states. Thank you. So remember I asked you the question, how were states formed? It would be an interesting thing for you to look up. There's more to it than this, of course. But it does have to do with breaking treaties and promises and laws and so on and so forth. Next one. Jim Crow laws, the South's highly evolved system and customs of leasing enslaved people regenerated itself around convict leasing. By 1900, the South's judicial system had been wholly reconfigured into laws specifically written to intimidate blacks, criminalizing them for changing employers without permission, vagrancies, riding freight cars without a ticket, engaging in sexual activity or loud talk with white women. Right. So I'd like to invite you to think about this for a minute and ask you why do you think that after the Civil War that these Jim Crow laws came into being? Remember, what was the purpose of slavery? To provide what? Labor. Free labor. Kind of cheap because it costs some money to house and feed the enslaved ones. But the purpose is to have people who will provide labor, right? So at the end of the Civil War, you get this. Because you still need what? You still need the labor. And it's not just for black folks. And we'll hear more about that in a minute. So thank you. Understanding power and economics. The Federal Housing Administration made it possible for millions of average white Americans, but not others, to own a home for the first time. The government set up a national neighborhood appraisal system, explicitly trying to mortgage eligibility to race. Integrated communities were deemed a financial risk and made ineligible, ineligible for home loans, a policy known as today's redlining. Between 1934 and 1962, the federal government backed $120 billion of home loans, more than 98% went to the whites. Property holders promoted segregation through the use of, ra through the use of racial convent covenants, covenants mm -hmm. which were validated by the Supreme Court. Thank you. So $120 billion at that time, I don't even know what that'd be worth today, but it's a lot of money. It's a lot, a lot of money. What is the primary way that we pass wealth onto our children? The primary way we pass wealth onto our children is through what? Yes. Property. Through property. So if you can't get your foot in the door, then what does that mean? And the reverse of that is gentrification. That's another topic to be studied that we don't even have time to talk about today. Next one. The landmark Social Security Act of 1935 provided a safety net for millions of workers, guaranteeing them an income after retirement. But the act specifically excluded two occupations, agricultural workers and domestic servants, who were predominantly African American, Mexican, and Asian. As low-income workers, they also had the least opportunity to save for their retirement. They couldn't pass wealth onto their children, just the opposite. The children had to support them. Thank you. Remember I said that systems are all about patterns and relationships. So you look at this act and you go, how is this acting out today? How is this being acted out in these times? Next one. Thank you. In 1935, Wagner Act helped establish an important new right for white people by granting unions the power of collective bargaining. It helped millions of white workers gain entry into the middle class over the next 30 years. But the Wagner Act permitted unions to exclude non-whites who did not have access to better pay and union protections, such as benefits as health care, job security, and pensions. Many craft unions remained nearly all white well into the 1970s. Thank you. This one is particularly significant to me because my father was the first black teamster ever hired in New York. 
and it was a really big deal. Even though the Teamsters were known for um, being more integrative in terms of who they worked with, it was a big deal for that to happen. Yes, last one. The 1956 Interstate Highway Act allowed white people to move further out from the inner cities, but the federal transit policy did not follow. It wasn't until 1964 and 1970 Congress contributed significant money to urban mass transit. Employers, did, employers noticing that many of their employees were leaving the city and wanting to take <coughs> advantage of cheaper land and access to highways moved out to the inner cities. The cumulative, effects that were, the cumulative effects were that jobs left the inner cities, but people of color were neither able to move because of racial covenants, covenants. covenants nor were they able to travel to employment due to lack of access to urban transit. Thank you. Give them a hand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. So I hope I'm making my point here. There's so much that we don't learn. None of you in this room created these rules and regulations or passed these laws. Is that true? <coughs> but it does require, even though we didn't create the history, and we didn't create the system, we live in it. It means that you, as responsible citizens, some of you who are here who are older and have children, those of you who are yet to have children, some of you who will never have children. But when you think about the future of the Earth, when you think about the future of the United States, when you think about what it means to really look into what you've been taught and how it robs us, all of us, of our ability to really have true connection with one another. We're paying a really heavy price. We cannot afford to think we're just individuals having individual lived experiences. We go to college, we go get that good job, we get a house, we have a family, maybe a dog or two, a cat if you like cats. But there's more. There's more. It's kind of like the way I tend to think about it. It's like we're all on this big boat, this big ocean liner. And there are holes in the boat. And it doesn't matter whether you're on the bottom of the boat or you're clinging to the mast. You're going to get wet because that boat is not in good shape. Now, there are a lot of amazing things about who we are and, of course, what this country is. But like anything that wants to grow well, at some point we need to take stock of what's working and what's not working. What we know, what we think we know, and what we don't know at all. Part of that is by talking to each other. So I want you to turn to the person that you're sitting next to right now and tell them one thing that you've learned or one thing that is important to you, because maybe you already know all of this. But what's something that you've learned in this short presentation? Go ahead. You have like three minutes. Oh, I missed you.
So how many of you found at least one thing that you could talk about? Is there anybody who couldn't find anything? What about the two of you right here? Did you find something that you could talk about? You with the black and white baseball cap and your friend sitting next to you, did you find anything you could talk about? You found something? What was it? Mm -hmm. And what did you mean by no one will ever be happy with what they have? I see. I think I understand what you're saying, but I'm not sure. Um, anybody else want to share something that you that stands out for you? Yes. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have like specific examples of when that has happened in history. Um, and so these were like specific examples that showed me what people mean when they say like the institution of racism. Right. So there's an impact based upon things that are institutionalized that affect people. They're not just abstract rules. But if you go to racialequitytools.org and you look up this term that you just gave, you might find a lot of things. Why is it important to educate yourself? Yes. Yes, in part, so you can educate others, yes. To learn from our history for what reason? Yeah, we don't want to repeat it. Anybody else? Yes. To learn my own biases. To learn about your own biases. Very important. We all have them. They always come as a shock. No, oh, I didn't know. I did that or felt that way. But it's not an indictment. I want to encourage you to be curious, not just to feel bad. That doesn't do any good for anybody. Not to feel guilty, but to figure out what action are you going to take. So I want to give you an example. I'm going to call them three S's. This is my assignment to you, which of course you do not have to do unless your teachers happen to be in the room and you <laughs> follow up with this. I want you to come up with something that I call the three S's. Small, scheduled, but significant. Small, scheduled, but significant action that you can take to deepen your knowledge. This is your home. The Earth is a planet we all live on. What's one thing you are willing to do to increase your understanding? It may be something in the system. You may want to increase your understanding about implicit bias or privilege, which everybody gets upset about. But again, it's not an indictment. Privilege is something that everybody should have. And I want to give you a very quick example because I'm running out of time. So I have three children and five grandchildren. My youngest is male. And when he was 16, of course, he couldn't wait to drive. So he got his learner's permit. How many of you have your learner's permit here? No? Nobody here is learning how to drive? How many of you already drive? Oh, I see. I asked the wrong question. So questions are really important. They're really, really important. So were you excited when you first went to get maybe nervous too, but were you excited when you got your permit to drive? It represented some kind of freedom too, right? So we had to have what's often referred to as the talk with my son. The talk goes something like this. Roby, you can be anything you want to be. Work hard. Educate yourself. Do well in school. Do the right thing. But when you're in your car, if the police pull you over, keep your hands in plain sight. Don't reach for anything too quickly or at all. And it's yes, sir, and no, ma'am. Do you know it broke my heart that I would tell him this competing message? You can be anything you want to be, but when you drive your car, don't do this. Why did I tell him that? to save his life. I want my son to live. Do you know he got stopped so often, it got to be kind of like the family joke, except for it wasn't funny. And he's 33 years old, 
and I still worry about him. For those of you who would never have to worry about having that talk with your son or your daughter, it's not that you shouldn't have that privilege, but I should have it too, don't you think? Don't you think it's fair and equitable for my son to be able to drive in a way that any young man or young woman wants to drive? Tiny, tiny example of privilege. So don't be afraid of the word privilege. The struggle is to make sure that everyone has access. Everyone is entitled to an education. Everyone is entitled to love. Everyone is entitled to living as good a life as they possibly can and have the support that you need to be the best that you can be. So I'm out of time. I want to say, first of all, thank you so much. We just got through a lot of territory. And again, all your body parts are still intact. <laughs> it's OK. We had a conversation about race. You maybe learned a few things. And I just want to thank you so much for paying attention. Now you can take your phones back out. OK. Thank you.